everyone. Thank you very much for joining. Um, we're going to be covering dynamic content uh, today, some of the features in Broadsign that support it, some best practices, and uh, a real-world example of a recent dynamic, uh, dynamic content project uh, that we completed. Let's get into it. Um, before we get to the fun stuff, so who am I? Uh, my name is Jody. I've been with Broadsign for uh, just over 15 years, and I've, uh, I've worked on multiple uh, projects in multiple departments uh, during that time. Um, I've been able to work uh, with our clients on both uh, the deployment and the setup side, as well as also creating various HTML content uh, and backend APIs to enable our client vision. Um, one of which we're going to cover uh, in more detail during this webinar. So that's me. Um, the webinar, who is it for? Uh, so it's intended for anyone running a broadside network that wants to facilitate dynamic content for uh, either the ad campaigns, um, also anyone that's tasked with dynamic content for just informational purposes, doesn't necessarily need to be an ad, it could be, uh, you know, like train times, uh, news, weather, any kind of uh, content that updates itself. Um, and then also uh, a little bit of information for anyone that's actually tasked with making the content or putting the content together. Um, so there are some uh, technical aspects of the webinar, but it's still gonna be kept relatively high level. Um, that's me, that's who it's for. Uh, let's jump into why dynamic content. So um, dynamic is important to uh, digital deployments because uh, digital at a home and digital signage, uh, we have a pretty powerful aspect um, that a lot of other media types don't have access to, which is knowing the location. Uh, mobile will have uh, tracking information as well, but it often lacks the context of exactly where the person is. Um, knowing the exact location of the screen gives us the context of what type of audience will be in front of the screen, uh, and it's a good indication of what types of content um, that will work to increase their engagement. Um, we use this context to enable effective marketing or provide relevant information to the audience. Um, to give you a better idea of what I mean by this, uh, we have a couple of examples just to lead into, um, into the case study. So I'll start off with, this is, uh, I like this one a lot. It's in our uh, ebook that uh, I'll tell you about later on in the, the slide. Um, but it's an ad for Virgin Rail in the UK. Uh, it was made by a company called Grand Visual that does uh, a lot of dynamic content. Um, basically the screens are mounted above uh, motorways, highways. Um, and it displayed the arrival time um, to a location, in, uh, in this case, London, uh, by car, and then compared it to train as well. Um, so the message is super clear that the train was faster, uh, but it also gives the context of its location. So if the motorway is heading towards London, you get to see the exact amount of time it's going to take you, which is useful if you're on a drive, but also that it would have been faster by train. So it's, a, it's very impactful. It's reaching the exact right audience because we know the exact location, and the dynamic nature of this allowed the... Uh, the content to give the accurate time. Um, it, it just enhances the relevance and it makes the message more impactful. So that's an example of, uh, of an ad campaign using Dynamic. Um, another more recent example, uh, this was put together by a company called Voodoo. Um, it was for the COVID-19 uh, pandemic that we're all enjoying right now. Um, it took a, a feed of the number of recoveries from COVID uh, and enabled networks to display them uh, in a message you know, just to raise people's hopes uh, and you'll push the resilience against, uh, against this as we go through it. Um, so the content was formatted for multiple uh, screen sizes across multiple networks. Uh, and it was another good example of, you know, taking information that's relevant to people uh, and pushing it out there. And uh, just as a last example, I'll use this one, Quebeco Media. Uh, it operates a network of transit shelters for buses uh, in a handful of cities in Quebec, uh, as well as displaying advertising um, I have my Avengers poster there. Um, uh, it also displayed a banner at the bottom of the screen that actually uh, communicated the next 30 minutes worth of buses uh, arrival times to anyone outside the bus stop. Um, it was updated in real time, so it, it would have the schedule if there was a connection to the internet available at the time, which for the most part there is. Um, it would actually have real time information, so if the bus is going to be a bit late or a bit early, uh, anyone stood uh, next to the sign will, will know about this. So um, at a high level, what is dynamic content? There are multiple components uh, to a successful dynamic content deployment. Um, they're not necessarily all present in every single uh, dynamic content. You know, some will just have one or the other. Um, but the, the general approach uh, is first, there's data. 
Um, the NAVIC content can adapt to changing information in both how it behaves uh, as well as what it will display. So sourcing the data that you use can be one of the more complicated parts uh, of the process. If you're lucky, uh, it will be publicly available in a usable format. Um, often it can be found, uh, but it might need a little massaging uh, to be used as desired. Uh, and if you're not so lucky, you'll actually end up having to compile the data uh, yourself. Um, data can come from either a centralized server, so like uh, you know, something on the, the internet where all of the players connect to it to get their information, but it could also be a local uh, sensor. Um, Quibity ad mobilize anyone that does uh, audience recognition where they have uh, like a male, female gender account. That can also feed into dynamic content through various um, APIs on the player. So that can also affect the content as well. So dynamic content uh, can get the data from either a centralized server or a local uh, set of sensors. Um, however, the data is provided. Uh, it does need to be put onto the player, obviously, for it to, uh, to access it. Um, for remote data seek, syncing, um, frequently synchronizing it is often uh, better than a live feed, um, since it basically increases the, uh, the network resiliency. So if the network is out, just even if it drops just for a second, at the time you need the data, having it already on the player, if it was synced you know, a few seconds ago, allows the content uh, to still function. Um, in certain circumstances, if a live feed isn't available because of a network issue, um, it might be desirable to skip the content entirely. Uh, say, for example, sports scores um, or uh, middle counts or something like that where the information is updating in real time, it's probably better to pull the content than actually display stale content. So having some kind of system to manage that helps as well. Um, it's desirable to only uh, synchronize the data that the player needs um, rather than a whole uh, batch. So for example, um, for the, the bus schedules that we did for uh, Quebec or that we'll talk about, um, the information comes as a whole network. So the entire network uh, is known. We don't wanna push that out to every single player. We want a way for the player to identify what information it needs and then only grab that data. So trying to keep the um, the data unique to the location will save on bandwidth and stuff like that. Uh, the second component of dynamic is the logic. This is kind of uh, what's used to alter the behavior. Um, this can be playlist based logic, like whether or not to include the content. Uh, for example, the, you know, the lottery result over 20 million include it in the loop um, and if not pull it. Um, or it can be content adapting logic, like switching out the location logo uh, and color scheme if the content runs in different models. Uh, where the logic is processed is up to the developer. Um, it might get split between the back end and the content on the player, um, which is best is going to depend on the exact type of deployment, uh, but you can have logic on the player and the server. Um, in general, it's preferred that the player will handle any logic uh, that can minimize what's requested from the data as well. And then the last component is the actual content, what people see. Um, way back in time, uh, it was Adobe Flash that used uh, that was used for most of the dynamic content and digital signage. Uh, that, however, has passed. Uh, mostly now, everything's done in HTML. Um, there are some exceptions where it might be a, an application. Um, if it is an application, uh, this should only really be considered if it's something that already pre-exists um, or needs a localized access to a particular hardware uh, component on the player. Um, if the content will be running uh, at multiple different resolutions, um, it's also much easier in the long run to make the content responsive uh, rather than creating a different file for each type of screen. Um, responsive content is what allows us to see you know, a website on mobile, tablet, or desktop. It just tells the, uh, the content how to arrange the uh, elements on the screen. Um, if the content will only run on a network which has only one, like your entire network is 1080p uh, portrait or landscape or whatever, um, you have the same resolution everywhere. You don't have to make the content responsive. You can save some time there. Um, so at a high level, uh, that's uh, what makes up content. So now we can get into uh, a few more specifics and the fun stuff. So uh, the Broadstein platform has enabled many advanced dynamic content products and has constantly focused on adding new uh, enhancements to allow the next gen uh, creative ideas. Each individual feature is useful in its own right. However, there are many ways of combining them together, which is why I refer to the API as my Lego kit. 
end of the slide. So features can be loosely grouped together um, into those that allow data injection to the content, um, data transmission uh, both to and from the player, uh, and those that enable some kind of loop or playlist uh, manipulation in the order in which content plays. Uh, the full in-depth documentation for the player API is available at uh, broadenside.com. There's the link at the bottom. Um, with that said, uh, what makes uh, a lot of the more interesting projects come to life is the way these are put together. So today, um, for the, uh, the case study project that we're going to go over now, um, basically content variables, monitor sync, uh, query params, and transparency, these are going to be the four that I'm going to focus on uh, just now. So as I mentioned in the examples, um, we'll be using a recent uh, deployment we just did with Quebeco uh, to highlight how the dynamic content features uh, set was used in a real world project. A uh, little bit about Quebeco. Um, they operate uh, digital displays and other media uh, within Quebec, Canada. Uh, part, of the, um, part of their network consists of bus shelters around five cities, including Montreal. Uh, as part of their deployment, they wanted to display the uh, arrival times for each bus stop in real time to enable travelers to uh, keep up to date with any delays or changes. The project consisted uh, of a backend server to handle the data um, and also the content on the screen uh, to show that information. So we'll start with uh, the backend. Um, so I mentioned in the overview, the sourcing of the data uh, is one of the tasks to be completed. Uh, the STM and I apologize my friend right now, the Society de Transport de Montréal um, is the transit agency that operates buses uh, on the island of Montreal. And as, as part of its operation, um, it makes available feeds to update both uh, schedules and real-time data. Um, there is a formalized structure to the data known as the General Transit Feed Specification, which originated from Google. Um, and as I mentioned, sometimes we can get the data from an existing source, as is the case here. Um, however, the problem was GTFS uh, is designed in a way to aid route planning. So if I want to get from A to B, it's going to tell me the fastest route and which buses to take. Um, but it wasn't designed with what buses are arriving at this bus stop uh, and keeping track of time. So we have to kind of massage the data into the format that we want it uh, to be. Um, as such, we created a middleman server uh, that took the public feeds from the STM and uh, then it provided an API uh, to allow the players to request information about a particular stop uh, ID. On top of the schedule information, there's also another uh, real-time feed um, that basically tells uh, the player the difference between the schedule time and the actual time based off of a GPS transponder uh, on the bus. And again, each real-time update from the STM is for the entire network. So it's like a three to five uh, megabyte in size every minute. So if we had all of the players on the network trying to grab that, we would probably melt the API on their end. And also we would be getting way more information per player than we need. And if we're updating this every minute, the bandwidth usage would have been uh, somewhat crazy. So the, the server in the middle gets the network update, passes it, breaks it up. And when each of the players checks in every minute, they only get a couple of K uh, kilobytes information that they need that's relevant to the stops that they're, uh, that they're dealing with. So this minimizes uh, both the bandwidth and the server load um, by doing it that way. Uh, the GTFS backend, it's not specific to Broadside. So uh, the way it was built, pretty much any device uh, can connect to it. However, what was specific in the usage with Broadside was uh, monitor sync. So when the players actually connect up to the API, they're using um, one of, uh, it's a very old feature that we have in the software, it's monitor sync. So instead of the content itself reaching out directly to the internet and grabbing it, which you know fails if there's any kind of network issue, uh, the player in the background will reach out to the API every uh, minute for the real time and every day or so for the schedules. Uh, and it will copy that information locally on the player disk. The content is then designed to actually read from the disk, uh, display that information. So it's not uh, reliant on an active connection when it needs to display it. Obviously, real-time information, if there's no network connection, will expire quite fast. Um, once the backend is in place, we can move over a little to the, uh, the logic part of it um, that gets set up in the admin. So when configuring the player settings, uh, we make use of uh, three of the dynamic content features. 
So with content variables, okay, actually I'm gonna say a sentence and I'll clarify. So uh, we use content variables as HTML query parameters to specify the stop ID and transit agency we are going to get the data over, uh, over monitor sync. And to break that down a little, uh, each player within Broadsign is configured with its own stop and transit agency settings. Um, each time the player makes a request to the server, it will use those variables to specify what stop it is at, um, for which transit agency, so that's the query. And the server will use that information to only respond back with the relevant data uh, over monitor sync, and then it will then keep the uh, data on the disk. So to put it as simply as possible, uh, the player is now smart enough to get only the data it needs. And that's something that you want to keep a, an eye on, like especially if you're dealing with a large amount of data, you don't want to replicate it on every single player by just sending everything. Uh, if at all possible, breaking down the data that gets sent will save on bandwidth and load um, moving forward. So it's very much uh, desirable to have a per player kind of response based on the variables or the information we send to the backend. Um, I'm seeing a couple of questions pop up in the um, in the chat. I'm gonna we have a Q and A session at the end, and I will address all of the questions at the end. I should have said that at the start. My apologies. We will get to them. Um, so content variables. Uh, th this is one of my favorite uh, of the, the player APIs, um, as well as being able to customize uh, backend requests uh, like we've just seen. They also let us create customizable HTML uh, content that can adapt to the player's context. So. Uh, the player will generate multiple variables uh, automatically by itself. Uh, for example, we can inject the resolution of the frame uh, that it's going to play in, uh, the address or the zip code, um, the duration of the slot the content's going to be in, and, uh, and any other customizable option uh, that we like, which is how we inserted the stop ID for the bus stops and also the transit agency. Um, we can use the content variables to do things like change uh, animation timing, um, so, you know, if it's a 20 seconds spot, we can do the animations so they finish at 20 seconds. If we know it's a 30 second spot, we can spread them out. Um, we can, uh, you know, display a different address for each, uh, each piece of content. So if it was a location based, uh, template, um, we can put that up with the address. Um, we can use a zip code to get the local weather or news. Um, and you can even do more complex things with something like the lat long, uh, coordinates. Uh, where depending on where the piece of content plays, it might tell you the closest uh, store. So like if you wanted the closest gas station, the closest pharmacy, what have you, knowing where you are and then being able to do a lookup on Google to see the closest uh, pharmacy, you could actually present that information uh, within the content as well. Um, in the Quebec example, uh, the stop ID uh, variable is also used to control uh, which data is sent to the player, but as well as uh, what the content is actually going to look like. So what I mean by that, so this is a GIF uh, at the bottom here. Um, so depending on the uh, transit agency that the content was configured with, it will actually adapt its look and feel to suit that transit agency. So fonts, colors, logos, um, we could even have a, an entirely different uh, layout uh, if we'd wanted. Um, and that basically allows the content to adapt to its uh, situation. Um, the alternative to this approach, uh, is to have individual files for each of the agencies, which is not problematic in itself. Uh, however, it does introduce uh, extra management overhead, making sure the correct file is used. Um, the choice to have the complexity in the scheduling or the content is a, is a trade-off. Um, for, uh, for this project, there was also a requirement to have the banner show for 12 seconds and then hide uh, for 16 seconds. Um, in order to achieve this, we made use of the content transparency uh, feature. Uh, so the file was basically always playing, uh, but during its hidden times, it was transparent and you could see the content uh, beneath. Uh, this allows us to overlay the information while it's displayed uh, with a nice uh, visual effect. It will slide in, slide out. Uh, this also kind of allows us to, uh, in general, overlay information onto regular content if desired. So uh, the end result is that the people waiting for the buses, um, they have contextually relevant information displayed to them. Uh, this increases the chance of them valuing the screen, which in turn increases the chance uh, they will see the other media on the screen. Uh, if you regularly take buses, uh, the real-time data also reduces that, did I miss the bus feeling? Um, you get what you're waiting, which is good for the transit agency too. And just as a side note, 
I like this picture because this is actually the broadside office uh, in the background. Um, so uh, it, was, uh, it was good for the webinar. There's a, a couple of other features that were outside of the Quebec Hall, um, project that I wanted to draw attention to uh, as we go through here. Um, one of the, uh, the newer features that we brought in, uh, probably in the last few versions, was uh, SmartFeed. SmartFeed is kind of a combination of uh, monitor sync and conditions. What it allows the player to do is to synchronize a feed locally to the player, just like we would with uh, regular monitor sync. Um, but it allows us to actually enter some of the logic directly through um, the control administrator rather than uh, having to do it in the code itself. So for example, um, I might have a weather feed uh, being brought into the player, you know, using the zip code, I get the local weather, that's the stuff that I copy. Um, but I could use the, uh, like, you know, weather sunny temperature 25, I can actually put logic within SmartFeed to activate a particular condition on the player. So if the temperature is above 25, I play sunscreen and, uh, and sunglass uh, packages. Um, if the weather is rainy, I play umbrellas and vacation packages. Uh, you can kind of use that weather feed to turn on and off uh, particular types of content. Um, another example would be if you had a localized uh, POS system with inventory control. So you're in a store, uh, you have the inventory levels of each product. Uh, I could, for example, if I had a red t-shirts and a blue t-shirts uh, metric, depending on which one of those is higher, I can activate or deactivate the promotion for that particular one that is uh, overstocked. And likewise, if it reached a zero inventory level, I can pull the content uh, entirely. So by using SmartFeed, rather than having to build a lot of the logic into the content itself, um, a non-developer can actually kind of set this up uh, a bit easier um, and have the player adapt to the information that's coming in. Uh, it's, it uses conditions. So if you've scheduled a campaign before, you put the condition on, it will just include or exclude that based on what the feed coming in uh, dictates. Uh, another fun example, uh, this is from uh, a little while ago now, um, triggers. Triggers have been in the software for quite a while, uh, but the, the example here, this is the Battersea Dogs Home. It was a, an ad campaign that ran in the UK. Uh, what the little girl is doing there with the, the card is there was an RFID chip uh, put in each of the cards, and depending on which uh, chip the sensor picked up, it would play a different piece of uh, content. So what that allowed the campaign to do is have a particular dog follow each of the cards that the person had. Uh, so depending on which card you'd be swiping, you'd get a different uh, set of content that would play uh, for that. Uh, it's an interesting example since it's kind of a dynamic campaign. Um, it uses sensors and triggers, but the actual content that's displayed itself doesn't have to be uh, dynamic. This was just a video file that was associated with uh, a dynamic uh, trigger. So in that respect, dynamic content can be very complex, HTML-based, database on the back end, APIs involved. Um, and if that's what uh, makes sense, that should be the route that you, you take. But it's also possible to have a dynamic uh, effect with static content as well, based on the inputs that are going into the player. So there are a few different ways you can achieve uh, some very impactful uh, campaigns and uh, information uh, distribution. Uh, it's also worth covering a couple of the, uh, the best practices. Making dynamic content uh, is a little bit more complex um, than the regular uh, campaigns. Um, there's a few things to watch out for while you're making content, so it's probably worth check, uh, just covering those. Um, Chromium version, so the HTML engine that Broadside uses, um, the, our preference is for Chromium. There's WebKit and uh, Explorer on Windows uh, if you prefer, but Chromium is probably the most robust one. Um, as we add different versions of Chromium, different features uh, become available. So when you're making uh, content, if you have a specific network in mind, it's a good idea to have uh, knowledge of what version of Chromium it would actually support. Unless you absolutely need the latest features, it's probably best uh, not to use them because it will make it easier to run on um, lower end players. But if there is a particular feature you need, you need to make sure the version of Chromium that it's gonna be playing on will support it. Um, HTML, just like Flash used to be, is a bit of a, a funny beast where visually something you see uh, might be chewing up all of the resources on the computer or not a whole hell of a lot. 
Um, so depending on where this uh, HTML is going to be pushed, you always want to try and test it on the lowest power PC it's going to be running on. You'll, you'll be able to see any kind of like flicker or uh, stuttering uh, on the lower ones, maybe on a higher end system, you don't see it. So as with any content you're going to push out in your network, but especially with HTML, um, you definitely want to test it uh, before it goes out. Um, responsive content for screen size variations, uh, it's easier to deploy on networks with different screen sizes, so it's often worth uh, taking the time to do. Um, but it is more costly uh, to produce just because somebody has to take into account the different screen sizes and decide uh, how the content will be arranged. So if you have a network with different screen sizes, it's probably worth having um, some kind of like template from which the designer can start from. Definitely expect network outages. Um, even uh, networks that are wired uh, and not over Wi-Fi or 3G or LTE or anything like that, um, network outages do occur. Any content that is designed to reach out directly to the internet at time of play will guaranteed at some point end up with a you know, server error, 404 not found, um, a blank screen. You're going to have a gap in the content while the content is trying to reach out. Um, BoardSign actually has uh, some functionality that if it gets an error back, it will skip the content. Um, so we do have like mitigation uh, procedures for that, but we definitely uh, want to try and make the content read from local disk as opposed to a live network uh, to make sure we are able to play the content as expected. Um, for the developers on the call, uh, something else to keep in mind, uh, cause cross-origin uh, resource sharing. This is a security feature um, to stop malicious website, website stealing your Facebook passwords and the like. Um, for our content, when we play HTML, it is within a browser, so if you're trying to reach um, an API uh, on one server that obviously isn't going to be on the player server, you may run into cause errors uh, a lot of the time. So Monitor Sync allows us to get around that uh, as well. Uh, as I mentioned quite near the start, we do have a, uh, an ebook, Dynamic and Interactive Content. This was just 10 uh, examples of some pretty good dynamic deployments. The Virgin Rail one uh, was in there. Um, it's a good, uh, it's a good read, quick read. Uh, that's available on broadsign.com if you want to go there. And for anyone um, that is tasked with actually designing uh, the content, um, the technical documentation. If you go to uh, yeah, broadsign.com and the client portal, then broadsign control documentation, you'll find the player API with all of the explanations there. That has uh, examples in JSON, uh, XML. There's also a small uh, application you can run locally if you're just testing, uh, but it's pretty well documented. So anyone that wants to uh, get into using the Player API, the documentation's uh, uh, great. So it's on uh, bloodsign.com.